Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Student of early vernacular architecture since 1971, Huber has specialized in in pre-1850 barn and house architecture of Holland Dutch in New York State and Northern New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Swiss German, and and certain English settled areas of the Northeast. Huber's latest book out in August 2017, The Historic Barns of Southeastern Pennsylvania, Architecture and Preservation Built 1750 to 1900, has reached number one book on the Amazon bestseller list in its specific category of vernacular architecture. He is author of more than 270 articles in barn and house architecture and is co-author of two other books and editor of another book, Barns, A Close-Up Look. He has lectured to more than 225 audiences and has led dozens of barn and house tours in several states in the Northeast. He is available for historic and homestead consultation work on old houses and barns. So thank you, thank you again for joining us. Um, so, and um, how how did you get started in preservation? Well, the beginning, the very beginning of my preservation interest came from my interest, my very early interest in the 1970s uh, of trees, forests, and wood, and I was just enthralled with that. And I had gone to forestry school. I had bought books on on uh, trees and forests, especially the redwood uh, forests out in California. Yes. Uh, and from that, I was armed with some knowledge of, of trees and what they look like and and also an emotional connection to it in my case. And that led to the connection with old timber frame buildings. And of course, these timber frame buildings were made from from timber, just the way the words or the phrase sounds, and I made that connection, and so it was just a love affair from that from the <clears throat> from the early to mid seventies. I've had this, and of course, I soon realized that uh, so even some of the barns in the mid seventies that I had known were disappearing. Uh, one particular barn, a rare stone area stone barn in an area in southern New York had come down. I went over this hill and I had seen this barn in one particular spot and it was gone. And so that led to my understanding and and knowledge and awareness that that barns were not permanent. So I started to record them in the mid 70s and preservation, both house and barn preservation, but especially barn preservation was paramount in my mind. The um the stone barn that you referenced that was rare, was it all stone? Is that what made it rare? Yes, the other barns up okay. that way in, in southern uh, New York <clears throat> pardon me, southern New York State were frame. They had stone foundations, but above the stone foundation they were frame up there. But this was a very rare area um, stone For an old barn. Stone. And I yeah. and I never did take a picture of it. Or maybe um, I didn't. I misplaced it or something. But in any <laughs> in any event, yeah, it's probably on a roll of film somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so how did you how did you start your business? Well, for many years, I wanted to. I was a contractor, <clears throat> but I didn't. I wasn't crazy about the work. It earned me a good livelihood. But I wanted to get into historic preservation 
on some level. I did not work, want to work for anybody else, and I didn't really know how to do that. And then come uh, the year 2000, and I moved from northern Jersey to Pennsylvania, and I wanted to I wanted to take a course in historic preservation, and there was a school in Bucks County that offered the course, and that was pretty good. I, I knew a fair amount of that uh, material anyway, but then I, I completed the course, did well, and then the next year, and I started my contracting business here in Pennsylvania, and I kind of struggled, and then the next year, I took a course in documentation, and what that did actually was t- uh, teach me the whys and wherefores of doing chains of title or property ownerships. And then after I got back from right after 9-11 from a, a month's trip to England, I said, I'm just going to give my company a name. And I had this, all the stationery made out. I had business cards made. And, and then I put an ad in the paper and, and got a few a few uh, responses, and so I would do this work in my spare time kind of thing, and that was okay, but then I got the bright idea that I would be a vendor at the Kutztown Folk Festival, yes. and I did, and I got something like eight people who signed up, oh, that's and, great. That, and that's what did it, and I told them what I would do. I would do reports on their architecture, on their property ownership, and I did family histories too, so that's what really started it. And so I've been doing it for sixteen, almost seventeen years now, full time. And you do, and you do barns and and homes, correct? Right. I'll, I'll do any okay. historic structure that somebody wants to. Oh yes. Uh, yes. Obtain knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we kind of talked about you know your why of preservation, but why what what really brought you into barns? Why barns? Well, there's something about barns that houses don't have. In the beginning, barns. In the beginning of my interest, I realized that barns had revealed structure. So all these timbers, the roof structure, the bends, the framing units, were revealed. They were out in the open. You could just see them. Right. And this, this intrigued me very much. The, the, the manipulation or the transformation of, of trees to timbers to beams using a broad axe, using cutting axes of various kinds, and then transforming into these bents that form the structure, the skeleton of these timber frame buildings were was exciting to me. Right, and, and even if a house is constructed that way, you don't see it because we cover that up. That that yeah, right. that is a different way of looking at it. Yes. And there was something yeah. romantic about a barn that a house didn't have. Of course, you live in houses. Although right. I have to say, I don't know how much of your audience may or may not know. But early on in the 17th century, in the 1600s, the Holland Dutch, I, I believe some English, and actually even uh, the German, Germans and English in Pennsylvania actually built combination house barns. So oh, they, I they know actually, that. Yes, they actually did exist. And I have I've accumulated uh, as many as 12 uh, references to house barns, or what's known in in the in the German language, the German j- dialect is Einhaus. I think that means one house. Um, Twelve of those, and I put that in my book, the book that came out in in August of 2017. I make reference to these combination house barns. And if you go, okay, over are to, there any still standing that you're that you're n- aware of? N- n- no, a fellow, okay, a, fe- a fellow Abe Roan, a friend of mine, back 15, 16 years ago, thinks that he saw he knew of one in the Hazleton area in Pennsylvania. But I never saw the barn. I never really made any spe- very special effort. There are some house barns, though, in existence. There's one or two in Missouri. There's, there's one or two or three in, in Wisconsin. I think this fellow who does some work with that actually knows of about a dozen house barns that are still extant or still existing in North America. Oh, that's... Yeah, and I've never seen one of those, but I but I know yeah. of uh, I know of, the, of this of this fellow who still studies them. There, that's very interesting. I learned something. <laughs> um, yes. So what? Yeah. What do you wish that you knew when uh, when you started that you know now? 
Well, I'm, my 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 exposure and my knowledge of, of these buildings is far greater than, uh, of course, back 40 years ago, 45 years ago when I started. Um, but everything is a learning curve. Everything is, um, <laughs> pardon me, is a is a, is a learning curve. And um, I wish I had one thing. I wish I had done early on, and again, this comes back to the learning curve, is that I wish I had recorded Barnes. I mean, it, t- it takes awareness to know exactly what to record and how to record it, but it was, it was more right. the how to record, and I would have done it much more stringently. I've even learned just in the last three or four years of how to, when I, when I go out to uh, the world at large, and I take photos, and I come back, and I put these digital photos on my computer, how I would how I would categorize them and put them into certain folders and files. And so they're easier ways. to find. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I just didn't realize that. And this is this is even five years ago. I wasn't aware of how to do that, and I'm still learning. Right. And maybe yeah. you can and hire. Maybe you can hire somebody to say, well, when you go out and you do this, you do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And of course, I've never spent the money to hire someone to know the absolute best way. But I'm learning, and, I'm, and, and, and just the job of labeling these things is a tremendous amount of time. You know, I t- I, let me just say this. I take breaks, and I look at Netflix, and, <laughs> and that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, time to actually, uh, I, can, I can divide my screen into one, the, uh, the digitalized photos, and the other one, the, the Netflix, and I, can, and I can do this with the, uh, with the photo. I can categorize the photos while I'm looking at Netflix, and it doesn't take that much concentration. So, you right. know, it, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's organization, it, it, and I see a lot of buildings during any, any typical year. In June or July, I'll be going down to Virginia. A, a fellow contacted me who knows of a number of early buildings in the Shenandoah Valley, and I never knew about this. And it was, it was postulated that there were no pre-1850, not 1750, but even 1850 barns in the Shenandoah Valley, and that's completely wrong. So I go down right. there. I'll, I'm, I'm, I may take 500 or 800 or 1,000 photos, and I come back. I can't possibly, unless I had a secretary or, a, or, or an office person to do that, I can't possibly do label all those. So, I mean, that, that's just an example, but I'll treat that differently than, 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 a, than a trip that I made, say, out to Franklin County in, in Pennsylvania that I did in 2011. So, anyway, that's, that, that's the kind of thing that I wish I had done much earlier on. And those are just digital photos. Those, those, those don't even focus on, on the, um, on the non-digital that's photos that I have in my yes, collection. Yes, yes. Yes, and and I'm I'm thinking too. I know that we, you know, as you get exposed and you meet people and you talk to them and you learn things, you do. I I find that you know some solutions we would offer, you know, even, you know, five or six years ago are different than what we would do now because we've you know learned things. And 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 I I think it's better to be working with people that that will will admit they don't know everything and and are willing to learn than than somebody who you know says their way is the only way. When I do my reports, and, and there's something that I that I observe or experience or something like that, I did a job toward the end of January out in uh, Cumberland County, and I had never seen this this feature. I had never seen this feature, okay. And the thousand many thousands of barns I've been in, I've never seen right. this feature. And I r- openly admitted the guy followed me out to his barn, and we were looking around, and I was taking notes and measurements and all that. And I said, I've never seen that. I told him that it wasn't a big deal. He accepted it. Yeah. He didn't. He yeah. didn't slash my throat or anything. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not that big a deal. It is. I think what people, a... I think what people are looking for in any kind of business is your enthusiasm, your sincerity, and just your honesty about what you, what what you're doing and everything. And I think people I deep down know that you can't know every imaginable thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So tell me, tell me about your barn history report. Well, what I do when someone calls me and I go over the particulars, give them a price and everything, I go out to their, it could be a, a half a mile away or it could be 200 miles away, which is what I've done. <clears throat> I'll go out to a barn site and I will get a general lay of the land. I don't do site plans necessarily because that involves a lot more work. Right. More, more than they're willing to spend. 
but I get a general idea of the site plan, where the house, where the barn is in relation to the house, and I get an idea of that. And then I will, in relation to the road, in relation to the approach lane, in relation to the main road, the, and, and all that. And then I will look at the exterior of a barn. I'll take down many measurements, uh, notes about the exterior. Is it made of stone? Is it made of frame? Is it made of brick? And then I'll go into the interior and take uh, and go from the top, the rafter system, the roof support structure, all the way down to the basement. And just take all a, a lot of photos. I'll probably typically take anywhere from 60 to a, 125 photos of the outside of the barn, the inside of the barn. And, and see what I have. And then I will go back to my office at my home and put all these things together. I will include, I don't do this with house histories, house architectural examinations, but I do it with barns. I will include a glossary of barn terms. I have, I just instituted Saturday for the first time in my barn news and events newsletter, a glossary of terms. I should have done that before, but better late than never. And so that people, when I, you can't always explain everything in an article, what a pearl and plate is, what a, what a, a canty queen post is, or that kind of thing. So I have this right. glossary of barn terms now that people can refer to. And so I, uh, and any, any barn history uh, will include anywhere from about 1,500 words to maybe three or 4,000 words. It depends on, on the level uh, or the depth, in-depth uh, look at or research that they want want me to do, and uh, the greater the, uh, the the longer the length of the of the uh, of the report, the more information will be uh, will be offered. And are there are are they uh, since you were saying that they're different lengths? Are they so there, are they somewhat customizable uh, with your when you're working with your clients? Well, I mean, yeah, every, every barn mm -hmm. is different. I don't care where you go. Who, who, even the, if the same builder built a barn, he's going to do a few things differently. So, yeah, right. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much customized. I mean, I tell everybody. I had, a, I had a potential client one time about 8, 10, 12 years ago, and I was sitting at their desk, uh, sitting at their dining room table, going over some of the, uh, some of the uh, things of, of, a, uh, of a barn history, and the, the woman looks at me and she said, don't you get bored with this? And I, I was okay. amazed. No one had ever said that to me before. Yeah. And I, said, I, said, I said, no, all these, all these buildings are, are, are unique. They certainly have repeatable features. And right. it's the repeatable features that will help yeah. me. It's these features that are repeated that allows me to understand uh, when buildings were built. And that's one thing I didn't mention before, that I can go into a house or a barn and and just from the architecture itself, uh, ninety percent of the time, be able to tell the age of construction within about ten to fifteen years, the actual date. So I can do that. Yeah, and that's that's I know um, from my experience that's hard to do if you're in different a different region than you're used to being <laughs> too, because the, there were variations regionally. And I know that um, in Lancaster they say, you know, we're, we were probably or you know, in, until the probably the 1900s, we were you know, 10 to 15 years behind where they were in Philadelphia. So you know, it's, it, where, wherever you that, are, you know, you have to you have to know the region. You have to make an adjustment. That's that's yeah. correct. Yes, that yeah. is correct. But still, I I feel confident enough that I've seen, and this is the truth, and, and it may not be a hundred percent true, but I feel confident that I could go anywhere in North America and tell a building construction date within 10 to 15 years. I did based that out on, in California. Based on the construction, yeah. Yes, on, 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 yeah. The, on the micro features and the macro features. I, mm -hmm. I went out to California in 2000, 2008, and I went along the coast, and there were, there were a number of barns out there, and I looked at, I spied on one, and I approached <laughs> the owner, and he said, sure, you can go into the barn. And so we went to the barn. He had a number of, of relatively early tools and everything, and I told him the, the date of construction, and I could guarantee you within about 95% chances, I was right on with that. And it's not a big deal. I mean, if you look at enough 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 uh, uh, buildings, and you right. can make comparisons, and it really does get involved in the in my book, in, in the barn book, I have a chapter on construction elements, 
And that had never been done before, which I'm very happy I was able to do that. But no, no book that I know of in North America, now another maybe in in, in Europe rather, um, that has been treated to some degree. But as a full size book and everything, I've never and I, and I did another book, a, a book on Dutch American barns back in uh, 2001. That's the year that that came out, and I get into that to some degree. But with this book. I really get into some quite fine details, and I could have even gotten into more details. So yeah, when you look at enough buildings, to, I'm sorry. I was just thinking sometimes it's hard to not include everything when you're when you're when you're trying to you know pare down for for sharing your information in a book. Oh, that's 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 exactly right. Yeah, you have you have yeah. to be very discriminatory, and you have to be very selective. And I think I was able to do that essentially. It's going to help a lot of people anyway. In any event, sometimes people call me anyway, and they say, you know, what, what can you tell me about my barn? Because a book can only go so far. It's a good general indication of certain kinds of things. So. Right. Okay, very good. Well, um, how, how can our um, listeners contact you? Listeners can contact me. Contact me. Uh, what they should do is they should email me. I think the best way to to do this is to email me at greg, okay. G-R-E-G, at Eastern Barnes, just like the direction, uh, and Barnes, an S at the end of Barnes. Some people don't do that. Uh, greg at easternbarns.com, and, and I have all this information on the thing. I may have uh, my telephone number is there, um, my PO box is there, and they can easily contact me and uh, let me know what they would like to do. And uh, that's that's really it. I have a website, uh, easternbarns.com. I also have a a house website, so to speak, past p a s t dash perspectives.com. I have that website, and uh, so it's easy to get hold of me. Okay, very good. And I'll make sure that those are on our website too, so people can can find you easy if, if, um, you know, if they're listening to it later on. Um, then did you have any offers for, for our listeners, um, any events that you'll be presenting or where to purchase your books? Yes. On the web, on, rather on the, uh, the Bar News and Events newsletter, there is a, there's all kinds of announcements. At the very end of it, I have a, a, a separate section called Barn Events. And you can... You can look at that. I have, I think, eight, seven or eight uh, barn events coming up. Uh, two barn tours. We have one barn tour in in Birch County, in Albany Township, that will be offered in the beginning of May. Although that may be filled up at this point, I'm not sure. Okay. And then we have, and then we have another countywide uh, barn tour that's being presented and sponsored by Barn uh, Birch History uh, Center in uh, late September of this year. And there, these are bus tours. And, I've, and I'm going to be uh, scheduled with uh, four or five or six barn talks. Uh, one barn talk I'm, I'm going to be very interested to, to present is uh, uh, barn decorations and mystery marks in York County, in York, Pennsylvania, that I've done this before. I've done Similar things to this before, but I'm formulating a whole new uh, PowerPoint presentation. So there's a number of things that are coming up. Okay, very good. And to sign up for your newsletter, is that on your website, or should they e- is somebody email you to get on the list? No, they should email me on that. I have not okay. incorporated the, the Barn newsletter on my website yet. Okay, the, very the, good. The, so. the, link, the link to my website is on the uh, Barn News and Events newsletter. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I will um, make sure that we have, you know, your email and your websites, uh, both both websites on the on our website, so people can find you easily. And um, you know, if if anybody's interested in signing up and hearing more about about barns and taking the tours or sitting in on any of your uh, lectures, you know, definitely make sure that you email email Greg. Thank you again for um, for coming on to the podcast, and um, I hope you have a great day. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Practical Preservation Podcast. The resources discussed during this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. 
If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.